Our government's printing money like crazy and then doing what with it? Pouring it down a hole. They do spend your money on things like a robot that folds laundry, shrimp running on treadmills, and in my rich neighborhood, free bike helmet. It's as if politicians live in a carnival game, trying to grab as much of your money as they can. Ethanol, farm subsidies, foreign aid. At the rate politicians spend, America will soon become like this country. People riot when politicians spend so much that there's almost nothing left. When there's no more money, um, there's just no more money. She won't convince the union. The unions elect people who give them money. And if there's any left, these lobbyists want it. Funding for housing counselors. The American Forest Foundation. Solar energy. It's relentless. But politicians who say no get booed. So most don't cut much of anything. We've taken a, a scalpel to the discretionary budget rather than a machete. But we need to take a machete to the budget. Or maybe one of these, because we don't make really big cuts. You could lose your pension. If they will do it to us, they will do it to you. But America can avoid going broke. Some politicians have shown us how to do it. You let 17,000 workers go. If you can't pay their salaries, what are you going to do? So what's our future going to be? More bloated government? Cuts to the budget so draconian you need a chainsaw to make them? Or smart cuts that bring prosperity? We have choices to make. And now, reporting from the debt clock in New York City, John Stossel. Our government keeps spending. You know we're already $14.5 trillion in debt. But you could say, so what? Look around, America's doing pretty well. What's the worst that could happen? Well, this could happen. These violent protests broke out once Greece was so deep in debt that Greece had trouble borrowing more money. The interest rate for Greece is 23 percent. Veronique de Rougy is an economist with the Mercatus Center. She says street riots are just the most visible consequence of a debt crisis. Greece goes on. They still serve in the baklava. Yeah, I mean, I don't think uh, Greece goes on. If you want to borrow money for a house, for a car, for anything, the interest rates that you face will be dramatically high. Greece spent so much that by last year they owed more money than their entire economy produced. No wonder they're in trouble. We won't reach that level of debt until, well, oops, pretty soon. We're on a clear track to a Greek-type crisis. The government cannot escape their law of gravity. When there's no more money, um, there's just no more money. Well, the federal government can escape. The federal government the federal, can print money. The federal government can print money up to a certain point. Government has been printing lots of money. Don't you wish you could do this? Of course, if we do it, they put us in jail. But governments are allowed to print money. Trouble is, when they do, that leads to inflation. Because the more dollars you print, the less each one is worth. That happened in Zimbabwe recently. It took 25 million local dollars to equal one American dollar. You had to carry armfuls of cash to go shopping. You've saved money, supposedly, for your old age to be able to enjoy life or to be able to leave money for your children. Well, that money is going to be worth almost nothing. So, if printing all this extra money is bad, what are the other options? Well, the government can raise your taxes or cut its spending. Tough choices. Politicians are supposed to make these choices. So what did President Obama do? He appointed a commission. I'm asking them to produce clear recommendations on how to cover the costs of all federal programs by 2015. They recommended a trillion in tax increases and three trillion in spending cuts. But the president didn't take those recommendations. That bothered even the liberal media. The total debt is $7.2 trillion on top of the $14 trillion we already have. How can you say that we're living within our means? I'm not suggesting that we don't have to do more. In your fiscal commission, you had a majority consensus to do all this. It's now been shelved. The notion that it's been shelved, I think, is incorrect. What was the point of the fiscal commission? It still provides a framework for a conversation. Then, our debt as a share of the economy is already too high. But look at where it's going. 
a Republican budget chairman actually came out with a serious plan, whereupon the president responded with his own plan. Today I'm proposing a more balanced approach. I don't blame the vice president for falling asleep during his boss's speech. It was more of the same. Obama said he'd eliminate waste and lower the cost of health care. But he proposed no specific cuts. And he said he'd raise taxes on the rich. Millionaires and billionaires. That's who needs to pay less taxes? Maybe not. But even if the president took every penny that millionaires and billionaires make, it still wouldn't be enough to cover the deficit. The gap between revenue and spending is so big that no level of revenue could cover that gap. The problem is spending. It's been increasing so fast, revenue can't keep up. Hence the talk about cuts. We've taken a, a scalpel to the discretionary budget rather than a machete. A scalpel? But a little scalpel won't make cuts big enough to keep us from falling into bankruptcy. We need something like this. We need to make bigger cuts or people will stop lending us money and we'll be as broke as Greece. But I understand why politicians are reluctant to make big cuts. Chicken! Look what happens when they try. About 20 years ago, the Democratic chair of the Ways and Means Committee was hounded by seniors for asking them to make small Medicare copays. They chased him and surrounded his car. The chairman fled to a gas station where he found his driver and made his getaway. His Medicare reform was quickly repealed, and for the next 25 years, most politicians ducked the issue until Congressman Ryan's proposal. Doing it this way actually makes Medicare solvent. Congressman Ryan's been booed, too, in his own district. <laughs> Democrats say his Medicare plan is why this woman won a special congressional election recently because she promised that she would not decimate Medicare. <laughs> After she won, her supporters chanted. Medicare! 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 <laughs> yes, we are all future seniors, that's for sure. <laughs> the message politicians get is, don't touch our handouts, especially Medicare. In fact, don't cut anything. Give us more stuff. Roads, bridges, transportation funding. We're all citizen lobbyists. Citizen lobbyists descend on Washington to try to get more. More money for transit. Funding for housing counselors. We went to D.C. during the most recent budget session to try to find out why the budget only grows. I'm attending a number of hearings. Uh, most of them are uh, appropriations related. You have all these lobbyists who are there all the time so they can be close to the power that might hand them some goods in form of tax breaks or whatever it is the government is willing to uh, to give away. We're just agents, that's all we are. The American Forest Foundation. Neighborhood Assistance <laughs> Office. National Urban League. They all want the same thing. We need additional funding. There simply isn't enough money. And so many lobbyists want the money that some pay bike messengers to stand in line for them. I wait in line till they get here and then they take over and I leave. After all, their employers have great needs. These insurance company lobbyists want more government-guaranteed flood insurance. And here's our congressman right now that had breakfast with us this morning. We certainly appreciate it. Wow, look at you. Her career may depend on pleasing these lobbyists. You're a natural. Well, yeah. let's, let's go ahead. Let's okay. talk. If a member of Congress has a troop of lobbyists coming through his or her office every single day, it's still up to him or her to say no. And that's really hard for them. They love to say yes. <laughs> they absolutely love to say yes. You want something? I want to give it to you because I need your vote. So uh, they are going to have to learn to say no a lot. They're going to need to practice in the mirror. Practice hard because there are so many advocates with so much need. This woman's upset about a governor's cuts. I'm a nurse. I care about people. He is going to make my patients sicker because he will not give me a voice to advocate for them. She even says budget cuts are racist. This is despicable. It's relentless. And people talk about the big lobbyists, you know, the, the Boeing or Intel or whatever else, and they're here. Uh, but they're outnumbered 20 to 1 by the, the advocates of small, specific uh, spending programs. Congressman Jeff Flake and Scott Garrett are a rare breed in Congress, actual budget cutters who resist the lobbyists, please. They make such a good case for patients are going to lose health care. You must be cruel to resist this stuff. 
That's the argument that they always make. There will always be somebody coming into your office asking for more money. Teachers teaching teachers. Avoid having budget cuts in housing. How do you say no? I appreciate your issue, and it is a good cause that you're coming to talk to us about, but unfortunately, that's not the role of the federal government. Restore funding to the National Writing Project. We're here to say stop the cuts. The fact that there are any cuts at all is due to the recent uprising by voters. <laughs> They elected dozens of new representatives who promised to shrink government. Finally, congressmen like Garrett and Flake have some allies. For years, you two must have felt lonely around here. Well, we, we hung out together. <laughs> yeah, it's been a bit, but there are more, more of us now. Maybe there are a few more, but most politicians keep spending money and printing money. What happens when a government can't print more money when they run out. I'll show you next. America keeps falling deeper into debt. If we don't cut spending soon, we will have to get one of these and make really drastic cuts. Then all of America will be like Pritchard, Alabama. Um, now, why are we not the budget? Why are we not the budget? Yeah. This woman's angry because her husband worked for the city of Pritchard, Alabama for 32 years. He held up his end of the bargain, but the city hasn't sent him a pension check now for more than a year. The city council says, we don't have the money. In 2003, an accountant warned the town, you will run out of money by 2009. The politicians then did nothing, as they admit today. Nothing never changed. Nothing never was accomplished. Right on schedule in 2009, the town went broke. So politicians declared bankruptcy and just stopped sending pension checks to retired city employees. More than a hundred of them. We want our money. They didn't do anything that they were supposed to do. They didn't pay us like they're supposed to. Alfred Arnold recently retired from the Pritchard Fire Department after working 35 years for the city. He'd hoped to relax and travel. But when the pension check stopped coming, he had to get another job. Now, at age 66, he's a security guard at the local mall. His wife was a city employee, too. She was a police sergeant. She got two checks, and they told her there was no more money left. We put our money in every payday like they're supposed to, and they said they're supposed to pay us, but they did not. Some retirees have died while waiting for a check, like the woman who lived in this house. Because she had no money left. She had to let her caregiver go. And there was no one to see about her, to care about her. And she died on a Wednesday, and they did not find her until on a Sunday. Gwen Williams worked for the Pritchard Public Library for 32 years. Now, at age 77, she had to start a new career as a school teacher. The city knew that this was going to happen, and they could have done something about it. Something like cutting back on frivolous spending. But instead, the politicians just gave their website a makeover. And the mayor of the town makes... About $95,000, $97,000 a year. You know? So if he makes $97,000 a year, why can he pay us? And the city has... Two or three judges where they don't need but one. And they got two lawyers. Plus... The public golf course has been a joke as long as I can remember. The golf course? Yes, Pritchard still runs one even though it loses money cost taxpayers tens of thousands of dollars every year. The city owns several barely used office buildings. The city also runs an Office of Economic Development and the Pritchard Housing Authority. They employ 40 government workers. There should be cuts made. Pritchard's mayor would not talk to us, but the city's lawyer did. Why didn't they make cuts? There's very little left to cut. You're going to be cutting into police and fire departments and getting the trash picked up. But the mayor makes almost $100,000 a year. Why not cut that? Well, that's a political decision. The city has a golf course that loses money every year. The website just had a makeover. Isn't that wrong? Wrong by whose definition? The city has its obligation to provide some degree of city services. How much does the town pay you? I don't understand why that would be relevant. It just seems wrong that the lawyers and the politicians get money, but the retirees don't. I have been asked to come into a hard situation. I don't know what the total is right now. They owe me still about forty to fifty thousand dollars. 
I've been asked to help the city, and I'm helping the city. But the